Welcome to another Dragonland Saga review episode. It is Majitog Frost Cult the Sixth. My name is Adam, and today I'm giving you my review of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Dungeon Master's Guide. I know. It was printed a very long time. I think like 2014. But I'm just getting around to it, so... So I'm late. Big deal. Still me. How you guys doing? It's Tuesday, and I'm already having a stiff one. That's how my week's been. You know what? So today is the official release date of Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen Deluxe Edition. And I pre-ordered it back in August when it first went on sale. Or sale for pre-order. And it's not here yet. I could just go down to the store and buy it. If you're going to set up a pre-order... The assumption built into that is that it will be on my doorstep the day that it is available to everyone else. That's what happened with the book, uh, Dragons of Deceit, that I pre-ordered. That came here to my home, delivered the day it was released. And I'm sitting here looking out the window like a dog waiting for his uh, master to come home. Nothing. Nothing at all. I have a game this Saturday where I'm supposed to run a Warriors of Kryn board game session. I don't even know how to play the board game because I don't have it. And I have no idea when it's going to be delivered. I have, and I, I pre-ordered it from the official Dungeons & Dragons store. That's how I got the, the pre-order um, D&D Beyond access to the PDF or the, you know, their version of it, um, of the adventure. So I'm a little bummed that I don't have it. I'm a little bit, kind of a lot of it bummed. <laughs> but what are you going to do? First world problems. Some people complain they don't have clean water to drink. I complain I don't have a fucking board, or sorry, a board game to play. That's, uh, that's how my life is. All right, so uh, Savage, thanks for joining live. Good to see you, man. Uh, Michael, what's up? How you doing, Chris? Always good to see you. Uh, what else we got? Solid Cumby, I've been saying solid crumby for so long. Sorry. <laughs> How you doing, man? It's good to see you. All right. So I, I sat down with the Dungeon Master's Guide and I read it cover to cover. And this is uh, what I mean, my, my ultimate review boils down to this. If you are unfamiliar being a Dungeon Master and you don't have an established campaign world that you're going to be playing in, and you want to create your own, then this is definitely a good book for you. However, if you have been dungeon mastering for any period of time where you're actually just comfortable with the game mechanics, you don't need this book. This, at all. Like it's, there's nothing in this that was profoundly um, like life-changing to the game. At all. In 5th edition, they put all of the rules in the player's handbook. Everything you need to run the game is in the player's handbook. So if you're a dungeon master who just wants to find out the 5th edition rules in order to run the game, just buy the player's handbook. You don't need the dungeon master's guide. This dungeon master's guide is filled with information about how to build out your worlds, your cosmos, your gods, your multiverse how to build dungeons, and it gives you an insane number of rollable tables to fill those roles for you in case you just don't have the creativity to create this stuff. That begs the question, if you are not creative enough to build your own worlds, why are you the dungeon master? <laughs> and that's a fair question. You should have some semblance of imagination right? Like that, that's built in assumption of playing role-playing games. But if you're going to step up and be the DM, one, you should understand the basic rules. And then two, you should definitely have imagination to either adapt an established universe, whether that's a film universe or a, a, a previously published campaign setting, or just to come up with your own and just have fun with it. They, they go through so many really, really specific rollable tables for, I mean, everything in this thing. All right. Uh, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. I got 12,000 subscribers. Thanks, guys. You guys are awesome. There are some really great strengths 
to this Dungeon Master's Guide over other ones, but they're buried in the assumptions, naturally, of this edition. So I've been playing since basic d and I've been referencing Dungeon Master's Guide from first edition on, and I think the most convoluted and crazy Dungeon Master's Guide, but also the most useful, is Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide. It's insane the amount of information that it has in there, but all of it is germane to developing a really great world. It doesn't, however, give you really great suggestions on how to develop your own campaign worlds, right? It gives you all the stats you need in order to deal with the worlds, but not really how to develop your own. One of the really wonderful things about 5th edition was that the Saga system uh, uh, version for, Dungeon, for uh, Dragonlance, excuse me, was that it gave you a lot of role-playing advice about how to be a good storyteller. And it wasn't a Dungeon Master's Guide. It was just the basic, you know, the, the dramatic adventure game manuals that came with the, the, the game itself. But it really taught you how to be a good storyteller. And that's something that White Wolf Games does an exceptional job at. And that's presenting a world and helping you as a narrator really tell a good story. This, this, it's the reverse for me, uh, is pretty good at that. It's not great at it, but it's not bad either. So if you're just new to the idea of, of telling your own stories, this does a really good job of helping you. And that's really the point of a Dungeon Master's Guide. For 5th edition. And the reason why I make that distinction is because it's it's constantly been going through my head since I started reading this thing. I think of a Dungeon Master's Guide as information that should not be available to players. That's not in this. There are suggestions about alternate methods of, you know, using game mechanics but they're so few and far between and sparse and not really helpful in most cases that you don't really even need them. Um, and I'm going to go over some that I think are really interesting, but just in general, you know, as, as a, someone who's been doing this for a while, it's, I was underwhelmed to say the least. Um, and the fact that if you present as a game system, all of the rules necessary to play the game in the player's handbook, then you're actually creating rules lawyers at the table. What I loved about AD&D was that it restricted a ton, almost the entire game rule system, to just the dungeon master so that the players only had to focus on their characters and what they're going to do in the game. That's all they cared about. And everything else, as far as mechanics goes, was in the Dungeon Master's Guide for the Dungeon Master to worry about, to be the arbiter of, of rules, or just to throw the rules out and do his own thing. And the players didn't know, and they didn't care, because it wasn't presented to them up front. With this, the built-in assumption is that this is the rule system, just like with 3rd edition, and 3rd edition was a nightmare for this, Players are going to power construct their characters and they're going to rules lawyer the entire game because they have the entire system right at their fingertips in the player's handbook. And so the DM is left just with their hands in the air going, well, I want to create a challenging experience for you, but I can't because you're in control of the game, not the narrator of the game, the dungeon master. And that's a huge power shift when the players are the ones controlling the rules, not the dungeon master. And I understand what you're going to say in defense of this system. You're going to say, well, you don't have to do it like that. No, of course you don't have to. But that's the built-in assumption when it's presented this way. And people who are going to be choosing to go to the table and play this game are going to come to the table with that built-in assumption. Um, and that bothers me. I think the strength of a dungeon master is their ability to, on the fly, flip rules on their head, throw them out all together, and just go crazy with it. That builds tension and excitement and drama, which is the purpose of the game as I play it. Um, it's really not to just get nit and gritty and fighting and arguing with players. That being said, I don't expect to be fighting with any of the players when I play this game on Saturday uh, for you all to watch. I suspect it'll go 
over well, but you never know because this system was built with the players first and the DM second. Um, so things that I really like about this uh, system specifically that are presented in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and I talked about this briefly with the, um, oh, what was it called? The Tassilov's Pouches of Everything Revised that was just released. Um, and that's the faction and organization system and specifically how to manage those faction systems with Renown. I thought that was a great addition to this version of the game. And it's something that, it's a system that is completely open-ended, but it gives you, as with every alternate system suggested in this DM's guide, it gives you some really vague suggestions and then just kind of leaves it up to you as the DM to unpack. With something like factions and organizations slash renown, you need a little bit more hand-holding if you're new to this. They give you rollable tables for everything else in this damn book, except for the one aspect of the book that I think is the strongest aspect, the renown system. So it's this whole idea that you can actually, you know, and it, you gotta extrapolate this out to Dragonlance because that's what this channel is all about. If you're in the Knights of Salamnia, for example, in uh, the, the Order of uh, the Crown, Crown Knights, um, you're going to need to rise in ranks. And you can do that through level, but you also have the other aspect of that, and that's the organization's hierarchy as well. Now, the way the AD&D always handled it was the higher level you are, by default, the higher up in the rank structure you are. But that's not necessarily always going to be the case. A good example would be, in my military service, you can be a 20-year a uh, soldier and not be, uh, you know, like an E7 or, you know, a high-ranking non-commissioned officer because you, maybe you screwed around, you got a bunch of, uh, you got in trouble a bunch and they just knocked you down your pay grade and stuff. That's the, the system where factions come into play with, with uh, Renown. You can be a high-level character. That doesn't mean that you're high in that faction. It just means that you have a lot of character hero experience. Um, you have to build the faction up in order to get to those leadership positions in those different organizations or to see some of the perks out of those organizations. And it doesn't have to be a difficult thing. You can just do it through straight role-playing or a result of questing so it's not tied specifically to levels. It's tied to your... Um, beneficial uh, actions toward that organization and then you sort of unravel these extra benefits for being a part of that organization whether it's leadership privileges etc uh, and i love that idea i think it's a really great built-in system that though they don't really flesh it out for you they just suggest it and give examples it's one that i will definitely use in every version of the of the fifth edition game that i play and I'll probably extrapolate it out to some other uh, editions of gameplay too, because ultimately I, I just like the idea of it over, for example, just being, you know, 15th level and now you're suddenly the, the head priest of whatever or you know, religious organization you, you ascribe to. I think that's really cool. Um, let's see. Uh, you never fight with a player. The DM makes the call and you always talk afterward. Yeah, that's how I have always played too. Um, and it usually works that way too. But I have definitely sat at tables where there's just bickering back and forth and you're grown men and women. You can't tell them to shut the fuck up and sit down. You know, God, I keep swearing. Sorry. Um, you, you know, you're trying to be cordial to each other and respectful. Like, you know, you want to continue playing with this group ostensibly if you're there. So you just have to sort of like eye roll, deal with the, the whining and then move on. I had one time where I had uh, two different players on two different initiatives, um, went through both of them, and then it was taking so long to get through the rest of the party because I had such a large, par large party that I was managing that those two players suddenly started saying one at a time, wait, you skipped me. And then I had to stop the entire game and go over the system saying, no, this is what you did last time, and this is why we're still waiting for it to come around to your turn again, because these other people haven't done it. And everyone else was like, no, you weren't skipped. You did this and this. And they're like, no, no. And it was just this big argument over whether or not they were skipped. And I just had to sit there and deal with them complaining about it until there was, you know, like with one of them, I was just like, okay, fine, just go. You go again. Who cares about initiative? Who cares about the rules? Just you want to do this now. You do what you're going to do now. 
and then it didn't work out. And I just attacked them verbally over. I was like, are you fucking happy? You interrupted the whole game to do this one thing that you failed to do. Congratulations on being the asshole. And then I immediately felt bad because I dressed them down in front of everyone else. But what the hell are you supposed to do when you have people acting like asshats? You know, you have to nip that shit in the bud. Unfortunately, you know, these people were genuinely my friends and so you know I, I apologized for my outburst and you know they apologized for theirs and we just moved on but you do have those situations where you have to deal with aggressive individuals and the closer they are to you the more they know you the more they know they can push you and so you hope they're not going to be dicks <laughs> but sometimes they definitely are um i did get that i thought that was really great savage uh, i thought that was cool okay so um, another thing that I really like about this was that it has a whole section on between adventures, what to do between adventures. And the built-in assumption of 5th edition seems to be, we provide you with adventures to run, you run through them, and that's it. And I've never played like that. I've always played where we are running a campaign with these characters, we may adapt adventures to serve the the campaign in some way or another but we never just do adventure it's over let's start a new adventure adventure it's over you know and so i like the idea of trying to create some semblance of continuity be between adventures because that's what i've always done with my players and ultimately they present those options in this which again is very reminiscent of event advanced dungeons and dragons how it's always been in the older versions of the game but the fact that they're presenting this as a new creative option tells me that it's been absent from the games for a while which is sad <laughs> because it's always been a campaign based game it's never been a single solo session based game the single solo sessions the one-offs are the exceptions not the rule so uh, at least it has, that's how it's always been for me and so i thought that was really nice that they added that in between stuff part of that in between stuff that they added in that i've been complaining about fifth edition is you have to train to level up. Now, they present it as an optional rule. In Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, it's a straight-up rule. And that's that just because you have enough experience points to get to level whatever does not mean that you level up mid-adventure or mid-dungeon crawl to that level. You actually have to go to someone who's better th than you are at whatever your class is and train under them. They will teach you the necessary techniques and abilities in order to then consider yourself the next level. And I can understand as a player, if you're in the middle of a dungeon or you're in the middle of an encounter and you finally get the experience to level up, you just want to do it right there so you get access to all those different abilities. But from a narrative standpoint, that makes zero sense. This isn't a video game. If that's how you want to play, go play a video game. You'll power up and it'll be like a Super Mario thing and you'll be feeling great. This is a storytelling game. And, and so it always blows my mind when you just deal with those hack and slash personalities that don't care about the story at all and they just want to level up to that next level to get that fix of whether it's a stat point increase, a new feat, or new spells to unlock or whatever, or new abilities based on their class. That's the sensibility that this edition forces you to have. So if you are unfamiliar with role-playing games and 5th edition is your first edition, then in your head, you're taught to believe that each new level gives me new abilities, so I have to level up, and that's the most important thing. And that's the wrong way to approach this game in my personal experience. Uh, it, it has to be story first, or else what's the point? Like, why does it matter if it's not story first? Uh, just go play a stupid video game and, you know, get off my lawn. <laughs> I'm, that, I'm that old guy. Um, I really love inspiration. You know, just the idea of rewarding a, a baked in rule system to reward players. You know, they, they provide you with the idea of um, um, disadvantage and advantage in the player's handbook. And I can't remember if they really dealt with inspiration in that other than you can get it. And what it does if they even go in that much but i love the dungeon master's guide in this where they really do break it down and present you with this idea of look if you have players that are doing a great job and you want to incentivize that style of play 
use this, use inspiration to do that. Um, and, and I just think, you know, first of all, at no point in any game should a dungeon master ever say, this is the only way you should play this game. Your job as the dungeon master is to cater to their styles of play. Because ultimately, you have different styles of play preferred players, right? Like, you know, you're going to have someone who just likes to socialize. You're going to have someone who just likes to hack and slash. You're going to have someone who likes to do uh, storytelling and getting into their roles and stuff. And you have to, it's your job to adjust to them. And so you can't just reward someone for playing in the play style you prefer. You have to reward good players across the board. And, and that's a really important aspect of this game. Everyone at the table has to feel like they're contributing and that they're of value to the overarching story, that they're actually helping shape the story. And in order to do that, you have to reward them when they're doing something good and you have to provide consequences when they do something bad. And both cases are going to regularly come up. Now, part of those consequences can be seen as railroading for play styles or for adventure direction. And if you're going to make that type of a, a sort of callous argument, there's nothing you can really say to, to counter it. That's just your perception. That's, you know, that's like your opinion, dude. <laughs> and that's it, right? But the truth is, is a good dungeon master is going to always steer players toward what they've prepared over what they have not prepared. So there's always some semblance of role playing, or I'm sorry, of railroading, especially if you're running a pre-written adventure. But that's not when you award people, you know, you're awarding people for just being a great version of their character, you know, and uh, inspiration is great for that. Um, yeah, and if you've never created your own campaign from scratch, they give you a lot of help doing that. And again, for seasoned DMs, it's not going to be helpful for you at all. But for new players, I think, or new DMs, I think it's invaluable to get that sort of help. Ultimately, what I prefer to do is let, again, I believe this is a, um, a shared storytelling game. I let the choices that the characters make inform any plot twists or anything else so for example in the fifth age game that i just finished um a, a week or so ago the forget the kender campaign um i didn't know how i was going to do the plot twist at the end that i knew i wanted to have a plot twist but i was sort of reliant on the characters to show me the way to unveil it and they ultimately did with their choices. And, and so it was through the course of four different sessions that I finally came up right before the fourth session with the idea of how to fully integrate that plot twist. And the fact that the twist was an old campaign veteran buddy who was not going directly against the party, but was actually trying to avenge the player's hero's character for the dragon overlords hurting him and it just happened to affect the party Th that twist was only developed because of character choices and background choices and so i that's how i like to get into this the prelude that i ran with um um the player derek uh we literally sat down a minute before going live and he told me his entire backstory for his character and his dad and his mom and everything and I use that information to, on the fly, create that prelude. And I, of course, reference the adventure module and their suggestions for how the prelude should run. And I, I use a lot of those story beats. But all of the role playing on that, all of the story development was completely from 60 seconds prior to going live and us just riffing the whole time. That is a wonderful way of, of helping a character, a, a hero, feel like they're genuinely a part of this story that you're developing with them. And that can't be taught in a book. That's only taught through narrative shared storytelling. And if you're just a hack and slash player, you're never going to understand that or get it. And that creates this huge vacuum for enjoyment, in my opinion. Um, I thought there's a lich. The cover is... Oh, you guys are talking about the, the monster. Compendium? Is that it? Were you talking about this guy? I thought he was a lich too. <laughs> he looks like a lich. Okay, so um, 
One thing that bothers me about this edition of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and it was carried through with the Dungeon Master's Guide from the Player's Handbook, is that they present you with alignment, but they do not present you with why it's important to the character. And they don't really rely on it at all. And that genuinely bothers me. Like, instead of using alignment to dictate behavior, they use things like um, uh, flaws and traits and personality quirks and stuff like that. But all of that is baked in to background, you know, your own backstory and the alignment that you're playing. Your backstory is going to inform why you are the alignment you are, and the alignment you are is going to inform how you play your character so that I, as a dungeon master, understand the choices that you just won't make and the choices that you probably more inclined will make. And if I don't have that knowledge as a dungeon master, it's hard for me to present you with morally ambiguous choices that will challenge you as a player and as a character. If I can't do that, that's another aspect of the storytelling narrative that's thrown out the window. Now I just have to assume that you're going to play according to your chosen flaws and personality quirks. And there's nothing to govern to make sure that you do. In Dungeons and Dragons, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, they actually tracked your alignment. So that if you made choices against your chosen alignment, then your alignment shifts. And that could affect your class. That could affect your religious ability to cast spells. That could affect tons of stuff. But at least there was some mechanic there to help guide players it's not so open-ended saying well i don't know what would i do well you're not you you're your character what would your character do there's a huge difference in those two questions and if you don't understand them if there's no mechanic to help you guide those choice differences then again it's just another part of the storytelling that's thrown out the window that doesn't mean anything um, and you're just missing it it has no rules for spending gold. Yeah, the result is people don't care about loot. This is something that I found that, that really kind of bothered me, is that it references money, but it doesn't really, you know, you, you just choose the, um, uh, the type of lifestyle that you live, and it tells you how much that lifestyle costs, but there's no real, like, substance to it at all. Um, it's just, it, it feels really, really hollow to me. When I was looking through like the loot tables, you know, roll for treasure and stuff, I was missing, and I didn't look in the, the monster manual, so maybe I'm talking out my ass, so please let me know if, if you guys know about this and I just missed it. Um, in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, each monster had a table reference for the type of treasure that it would have. In this game, it's challenge rating, not monster. And so, depending on the challenge rating, you may move on to, you know, have X treasure, which may or may not be logical. In, and they tell you that, well, if it doesn't make sense that the monster would have this, then just have it be the monster's uh, previous victims. And that's why that treasure is laying around. Well, that's a shortcut to thinking and that's lazy. So instead, have the monsters have certain types of treasure that they may or may not have, and then it's up to the DM to add to that if they want to. If they want to add that whole dungeon experience of, well, there's a bunch of corpses from previous adventures, or maybe your own previous adventure that you ran across the corpse of because the dungeon is difficult. Um, here's all the treasure that's there from them, and this is what the monster had in its own personal hoard or didn't have. You know what I mean? So I really like the monster first approach rather than the challenge rating approach. That's it's just, it's. It, it's a different way of looking at it is all. Uh, you're hoping for the Dungeon Master Guide for 6 he has advanced rules for riskier games. Yeah, one, another part of this that I thought was interesting is that it presented a whole bunch of really wonderful ideas of styles of play in this. And I think that's really important for Dungeon Masters to always keep in the back of their mind. Is that, again, we typically think fantasy, high adventure... It's Dungeons and Dragons, so of course that's what it's going to be. Um, but they presented a bunch of different 
ways of trying to extrapolate storylines that are maybe a little more in line with the World of Darkness type games or maybe like the Call of Cthulhu type games. It doesn't really explore those um, uh, game mechanics really in depth, but it actually does give you basic rule ideas very similar to Renown and with factions and stuff. So it does give you those foundations that you can then build on in this game system, which I really appreciated. Because ultimately, if you don't present them with those optional rules, then most people won't ever consider them as options. And they'll just default to whatever is presented to them in, in hardcore adventure manuals, or I'm sorry, adventures, uh, pre-written adventures, or um, you know what their players want to do, whether that's dungeon crawl, overland adventure, you know, make up a world that they just want to all sort of crawl around in open freeform. Uh, I've always loved the idea of having your campaign set with different types of experiences. So, so maybe some of them are going to be high adventure. Maybe some of them are going to be horror based or madness based, or maybe some of them are going to have, you know, massive romantic elements to them. And, and, and it's incumbent upon the players first and foremost, but also the DM to really take those uh, types of storytelling and really dig into them. For example, on Kryn, they have uh, in Talada's they have entire jungles where there's just mind flayers, illithids there. And um, that's like prime real estate for a primeval, very Cthulhu-based sort of ancient demigod type role-playing environment. And that's exciting to me because you have these, you know, especially with Dragonlance, you have this massive planet of Kryn with all of these disparate, uh, you know, two main continents, but different regions within each continent. And you can tell any type of story that you want and the ability to know that it's an option that you can explore just reinforces those moments where, you know, maybe it's a seasonal thing. You're like, well, it's getting to be, you know, Halloween season. Maybe we should think about, you know, taking this campaign in a scarier direction. Well, there's mechanics to deal with madness and stuff. And I know that, you know, the primary reason for doing that is probably Ravenloft, but you don't have to limit yourself in that way. You know, there's plenty of things that can drive you mad in Dragonlance. Look at the, the beloved of Chemish. You know, the only way to kill them is by sacrificing an innocent child. How crazy is that? But if you use that in your game, you're going to create massive moral problems for the characters. You know, how do you deal with that? And that, that creates, you know, you could even spin it off where if you actually do go through with it, you go down that path of madness because you have completely given up your sense of humanity. That's an exciting idea to explore in some games. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, th this does a really good job of presenting a wide array of play styles, of play options, of world building and campaign building options. To, in, in, again, you know, I'm going to be saying this the whole time over and over again for people who are unfamiliar with doing that already. Uh, for dungeon masters who maybe need a little bit more, you know, tapping them on the shoulder, but saying, hey, hey, have you ever considered this? It may not work, but at least consider it for a minute because you may find something that really resonates with you. And that's the whole point of a dungeon master's guide, right? I mean, aside from giving you all of those broken down mechanics that help really elevate the game to different levels, it's, it's really to inspire you as a dungeon master to make you better at what you're already doing. This is a little bit less successful in my personal opinion than some other Dungeon Master's Guide I've, I've referenced, but it is all there. And I think that's really, really important. Um, so the need to train to level uh, as an option, I think is really cool. Though, I don't know how realistic that is when you're playing a milestone leveling game. When, you know, when you're presented with this idea of milestone leveling, it's insane to me. I mean, it's, it's 100% ridiculous insane to me. Like, I ran the prelude with, with uh, my friend and the player, and now he's second level. Did he roleplay well enough for second level? No, but he did a great job roleplaying. Did he encounter difficulties that would equate to second level? No. No, not at all. 
he it, arguably the point of the prelude is to get you to first level so that you understand why you can actually cast spells and why you can do all these things but now he's second and so more power to him that's the module that we're running but it's just a, an insane way of doing it to me and then you know looking at the other level points presented in shadow of the dragon queen none of them really make any sense some of them you should be more levels you know based on what you experience and some of them you shouldn't be the level that they get you know they sort of force you to make your characters um, in order to deal with the the fate challenges to come I've always played in uh, games where if you can't handle the challenges, it's up to you as the player to, one, be able to recognize it, and two, get the hell out of there <laughs> if you can't handle it, and come back when you can. You know, go do something else. Find other ways to uh, gain experience. Not grinding, you know, on, on random monsters or something in order to get to that next level, but, you know, just... As, as, a, as a dungeon master, you should present insurmountable odds from time to time, but then you should also provide op opportunities for the characters to genuinely grow. And you may make the argument that, hey, it all comes out in the wash, so who cares? And yeah, maybe it does. I don't know. We haven't done yet. But it just seems a little hollow to me at this point. Uh, okay, not sure however you run your table is for you, but you disagree. The old bone grinder is brutal. And the castle can be brutal, and the other bosses aren't meant to kill the players, but stall them. Yeah, I'm not sure the references you're making, but I definitely accept everyone has different play styles. And so this is just my opinion. Uh, I do not expect anyone to ever agree with anything I ever say. And that's okay, you know. If you don't agree with me, 100%, that's totally cool. Play your style of game that you're happy with, and that your players are willing to play with you, and that they're happy with. And that's all that matters, because this is a game. I.e., you're supposed to have fun. And if you're not having fun, play something else. Um, see, I was going to go in here and uh, look at some of this stuff, but I don't know that... You know, I do like the idea they present here with uh, Tears of Play, for example, where they, they give you this idea of... Um, you know, levels 1 through 4, you're just sort of these local heroes. At levels 5 through 10, you're a hero of the realm. 11 to 16, you're a master of the realm. And at 17 to 20, you're master of the world. Having those sort of uh, tiers broken down for the player, I think, is really important to understand. For the DM, I think it's great to help build encounters uh, and really reinforce the idea to the players that they are, in fact you know, making an impact on the world that they're playing in. Um, I, I just think that's a really important aspect of, of uh, the DM player uh, relationship. Let's see, what else? Um, last Curse of Strahd, you refused to let your players rest in the castle that ramped up the final fight, but it still wasn't as risky as you'd liked. Yeah, Jay, and, and you know, in situations like that, what I like to do is just bump up the stats a bit, you know what I mean? Uh, to make it a little bit more challenging. Like, you don't want to outright plan on killing your characters, or I don't want to, but I do want to challenge them. I want them to make tough choices. And if that forces them to say, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice myself so the rest of you can get out, that's great storytelling. And that's how, like, you know, fables and legends actually are. You don't usually retire at an old age in a castle that you built based off of the treasure that you looted throughout your adventuring career. You burn out and die fast doing what you love. And that is playing the game, you know, being that heroic adventure type. Um, and I never really liked characters, uh, I'm sorry, players who refused to admit that their character could be so fallible as to be mortal and die. Like, yeah, it sucks you invest time in a playing character, but in my games, the reason why you die is either random chaos of the roles, which you just can't deal with. That's just, that's reality. Or you made bad decisions and you have to suffer those consequences of those decisions. You know, like, I'm not going to try to kill you, but if you die because of what you chose to do, that's on you, buddy. And that's just how it is. So, you know, that has always got to be in the back of your mind a little bit. Uh, when Dragonlance first came out, it struck you as 
Ron, it, how, uh, how it made dragons commonplace. Uh, hey, Thack of the Clown. So, um, yeah, I don't see that at all, how, how commonplace it made dragons. You know, in those original DL adventures, I mean, you, you ran into like a dragon, a module, right? And, you know, the second module ran into two of them, but one of them wasn't really even against you. It was against the other dragon. I mean, it, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't find that commonplace. You know, and again, it's the campaign world. And so if you're just used to that campaign world, then it wouldn't be strange to you. Um, but yeah, that's the reason why Dragonlance was developed because Dungeons and Dragons didn't have a lot of dragons in it. And so TSR was like, hey, how can we get the dragons back in Dungeons and Dragons? Well, they came up with Dragonlance. And that, that's literally the reason for it. So for you to, to acknowledge that it brought more dragons into the game, well, yeah, definitely. And that was intended. Like, that was the whole point. Um, not to say that it's good or bad, but that is the point of the, the setting. So what else? Um, we're having to talk about Ravenloft your players are about to fight Strahd that's cool let's see what you learn the DM is the most important person at the table when the DM is having fun the players have fun when the DM is bored and frustrated the players start looking at their phone I'm not sure I entirely agree with that I like the idea that you feed off of each other you know what I mean I like the idea that the dungeon master presents ideas to the players and then the players pick them up or drop them and then you know they inform the dungeon master how they would like to proceed with the situation presented it's a very reciprocal thing you know it's like having sex if you're just having sex with someone and they're just laying there like a fish i mean that sucks that's that's horrible but if you are both into it then you're having a great time that's really what you should be thinking of when you're thinking about what i should think of when i think about playing Dungeons and Dragons, not sex, depending on who I'm playing with. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the back and forth, that's what I love about it. Um, if the players are straight up bored, I have to try to overcome that and get them interested. If I'm bored, it's probably because the players are being boring. And so they need to lift me up. And we should really not think of it in terms of player's DM. We should think of it in terms of shared storytelling and narrative and helping develop the story together, ultimately. Um, that's how I like to see it anyway. And then you can have sex with your players. As long as it's consensual and you're adults, who cares? <laughs> consensual adults being the most important part of that statement. Uh, you come from the Vampire the Masquerade and World of Darkness School of Tabletop, uh, where narrative is king. Yeah, here, here, CCR422. Is that Credence? Um, I agree. Like, and, and that's what I loved about World of Darkness. And that's what informed my Dungeons and Dragons games after I had played um, Vampire and Werewolf. So that, you know, then I just straight up went to D&D and said, you know what, I'm taking this part of it because it worked and it worked so well. And in, in, in a saga system, it stressed, stressed that strict directly from world of darkness, uh, and its success. All right. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's it. That was my review. So if I'm going to give this a rating, uh, I'm going to give it a, a three and a half plates of Odic spice potatoes out of five. It did what it's supposed to do for new DMs, and it did that well for new DMs. It doesn't bring a whole lot to the table for old DMs, except for some ideas that previous editions already had, but it presents them as variant rules. And I don't know, you know, I mean, you, you just do that on your own if you're an old DM. You know, you're going to be altering the game system to fit your your games anyway. So what what really is the point? I loved it because of the renown. I appreciate it because of the inspiration and the callbacks with the variant optional rules. Um, but ultimately, I didn't learn anything terribly new after reading this. And uh, I actually don't feel like I understand the game any better after reading it. And that bothers me. Because I do feel like if you read the Dungeon Master's Guide, like if I didn't read the Player's Handbook and I just read the Dungeon Master's Guide, I would have no idea how to play this game. And that's messed up. How can you be the arbiter of the game if the book for the Dungeon Master does not teach you all of the rules about the game? That's ridiculous. So that 
really bothered me. But once you get past that and realize that it, this is a game for players first, DM second, then you start to understand why they put all the rules in the player's handbook and not the Dungeon Master's Guide and how they're trying to influence you to, to run this game. And that, again, is only players first, 100%. So, that's all I got. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And as soon as this uh, deluxe Shadow of the Dragon Queen arrives on my doorstep, I'll give you a well-presented... Uh, unboxing and exploration and i hope i hope it's by saturday because i'm supposed to play wars of crin this saturday damn it <sighs> fingers crossed thank you guys so much uh that's going to do it for my review of dungeons and dragons dungeon master's guide by wizards of the coast what do you think about the fifth edition of this game did you think that the dungeon master's guide gave you all the information you need to successfully run a dungeons and dragons game am i way off base because it's possible let me know in the comments. Thank you guys so much for tuning in live. Those that tuned in live and all your comments and, and disagreements and shared ideas together. Uh, that's what really makes all of this fun uh, for me and, of course, all of you as well. So let's keep that going. Have a fantastic day. And remember that this channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga, no matter what edition of a game you play in that world. I hope, and uh, for those of you who are joining, I thank you for joining in that celebration. This has been Adam with Dragonlance Saga. Until next time, Slanjavar.